Chapter 32 The Resurrection The sun had already set when the Blessed Virgin, St. John, and the Holy Women returned to the Cenacle in Jerusalem late on the afternoon of Good Friday. Going into the hall in which they had attended the Last Supper on the previous evening, the Mother of God thanked John and her companions for having remained with her throughout the Passion of her Son, and in his name she promised them a special reward for having been so faithful. She also offered herself as a lifelong servant and friend to all the women. They acknowledged this favor by kissing her hands and asking for her blessing, which she gave them. Then they begged her to take some rest and food, but Mary replied, My rest and consolation shall be to see my Son and Lord arisen from the dead. Yet you, my dear friends, must satisfy your needs, while I retire alone with my son John. When she was alone in her room with St. John, she fell on her knees and said, Do not forget the words which my son spoke to us on the cross. You are my master and a priest of God. Henceforth all my joy shall be to serve you until my death and my consolation shall be to obey you as my superior. John humbly yielded to her wishes, and at her request went to provide some refreshment for the holy women, while Mary spent several hours alone in her room, meditating sadly on the passion of her divine son. The other women, all except the three Marys, took some food and discussed the terrible events of that unforgettable day. They were filled with profound grief as they withdrew to their rooms for the night. At midnight the Blessed Virgin and the Holy Women arose and prayed together for a while under a lamp. At about four o'clock in the morning of the Sabbath, St. John came to console Mary, and she asked him to find Peter, speaking to him kindly, and bring him to see her. John was also to offer friendly greetings to the other apostles and to give them hope of pardon for having left their master during his passion. John met Peter coming to the cenacle after having spent the night weeping and repenting in a cave near the holy city. They found some of the apostles and went to the cenacle. Peter alone went in to see Mary first. Falling at her feet, he said with sobs of intense sorrow, I have sinned, lady. I have sinned before my God, and I have offended my master and you. The Blessed Virgin knelt beside him and said, Let us ask pardon for your guilt from my son and your master. Then she prayed for Peter and reminded him of the Lord's many acts of mercy toward great sinners and of his own obligation as head of the apostles to give an example of strength in the faith. Next the other apostles, weeping bitterly, presented themselves before Mary and asked her pardon for having forsaken her son during his sufferings. The very sight of her caused them to feel perfect contrition for their sins and renewed love for their master. The Mother of God encouraged them by promising her intercession in obtaining the pardon which they sought. And when they left her, they were inflamed with new fervor and strengthened by new grace. They felt an inward reverence for St. John and a feeling of confusion in his presence, as he had been the only apostle who accompanied his Lord to Calvary. But John showed only love and kindness to them all and with the simplicity of an unspoiled child he gave place to everyone. Throughout the Sabbath day, the holy women either prayed or mourned with the Blessed Virgin in the large hall of the Cenacle. The weak ones among them took a little nourishment, but the rest fasted all day. The Mother of God continued to witness in vision the actions of her divine Son after his death. She saw him visit the patriarchs and souls of the blessed in limbo. And now she saw the Savior, in the company of the patriarchs, hovering above the city, while he showed them the various places where he had suffered during the Passion. As they passed near the cenacle, Jesus directed their attention to the Blessed Virgin and said to them, 
There is Mary, my mother. Early on Easter morning, at the very instant when the holy soul of Christ re-entered and revived his sacred body in the sepulchre, Mary experienced a mystical ecstasy in which her grief and sorrow were transmuted into ineffable joy and bliss. Just at that moment, after knocking, St. John stepped into her oratory, and finding her in the midst of a heavenly splendor and utterly transfigured with supernatural exultation, he understood that his Lord had just then arisen from the tomb. Meanwhile, the glorious body and soul of the Redeemer came forth from the Holy Sepulchre, shining with all the brilliance of His divinity, and the risen Lord immediately showed Himself to His Blessed Mother, together with all the saints and patriarchs of the Old Testament. He was clothed in a long white robe with a mantle that waved gently in the breeze as He advanced, reflecting all the colors of the rainbow while his large wounds sparkled brightly. Mary prostrated herself on the ground and humbly worshipped her resurrected son until he took her hand, raised her, and drew her to himself in a marvelous mystical embrace. Then, in an ecstasy of fervent joy and love, she heard a voice saying to her, My beloved, ascend higher. And at the same time, she was given a more profound and intimate vision of the divinity than she had ever had before. Next, she turned to the holy patriarchs and the souls of the blessed, and as they bowed before her, she recognized and spoke to her beloved parents, St. Anne and St. Joachim, her good husband, St. Joseph, and her friend, St. John the Baptist. All of them honored her as the mother of the Redeemer of the world. And together they praised the Lord with hymns for his glorious victory over death until he left them in order to show himself to Mary Magdalene. Later, when Mary Magdalene and the others came to Mary and told her about Jesus' appearing to them, she listened quietly and kindly and strengthened their faith by quoting some of the scriptural prophecies concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. During the week that followed, when Thomas arrived and hesitated to believe that the Master had indeed risen from the dead, the other apostles went to Mary and complained about his obstinacy. Seeing that they were becoming angry with him, she calmed them by assuring them that Thomas's disbelief would, in the end, bring great benefit to others and glory to God, and she urged them to wait and hope and not to be so easily disturbed. Meanwhile, she prayed fervently for Thomas, and therefore the Savior soon enlightened him by allowing him to touch his sacred wounds. Chapter 33 The Ascension Most of the time during the forty days between the Resurrection and the Ascension, the Blessed Virgin remained in seclusion in the Cenacle, where the risen Lord appeared to her and spoke with her frequently. She spent more and more time in prayer and contemplation, praising and adoring God by singing verses of hymns alternately with choirs of angels and saints. But most of all, she prayed and fasted for the apostles and disciples, and for the spread of the new church. She prayed particularly for Peter as head of the church and for John as her adopted son. A few days before the ascension, the Holy Trinity said to her as she was meditating in a corner of her room, Beloved, ascend higher. Then the Eternal Father declared, My daughter, I entrust and consign to you the church founded by my only begotten Son the new law of grace which he has established in the world and the people which he has redeemed. And the Holy Spirit announced, My spouse, I communicate to you my wisdom, and in your heart shall be deposited the mysteries and teachings and all that the incarnate word has accomplished in the world. And the Son said to her, My beloved mother, 
I go to my Father, and I leave you in my stead. I charge you with the care of my church. I commend its children and my brethren to you, as the Father has consigned them to me. Then the Holy Trinity declared to the throng of adoring angels and saints, This is the protectress of the church and the intercessor of the faithful. In her are contained all the mysteries of our omnipotence for the salvation of mankind. Whoever shall call upon her from his heart and obtain her intercession shall secure for himself eternal life. What she asks of us shall be granted. Hearing herself thus exalted, Mary only humbled herself the more, adoring the Most Holy Trinity and offering herself with ardent love to work in the Church as a faithful and obedient servant of the Divine Will. And from that day she was endowed with the spiritual care of the Church, the mystical body of her Divine Son, and became the loving mother of all its children until the end of the world. On the evening before the Ascension, the Blessed Virgin and the Apostles and Disciples assembled in the Cenacle, where the holy women had prepared a festival meal with Mary's help. Although everyone realized that the Master would soon leave them, only his mother knew that this was to be their last evening together on earth. Mary stood modestly at the entrance of the large hall, while Jesus blessed the bread, fish, and vegetables which were distributed to the guests. After the meal, the Savior said to his followers, It is now time that as true and faithful disciples you become teachers of the faith to all men. I am about to ascend to my Father, but I leave with you in my stead my own mother as your protectress, counselor, and advocate, and as your mother whom you are to hear and obey in all things. He who knows my mother knows me. He who hears her hears me and who honors her, honors me. As supreme head of the church, you will have Peter, for I leave him as my vicar, and you shall obey him as the chief high priest. All present were deeply moved, and many were weeping. Early on the morning of the Savior's last day on earth, he left the cenacle with his eleven apostles. Mary, the holy women, and about a hundred disciples followed them as they slowly ascended the Mount of Olives. When all had gathered on the top of the hill, Jesus stood on a large, flat stone and spoke to them with calm affection. Then he said a few words to his mother. She humbly knelt at his feet and asked him to give them all his last blessing. As they knelt, Jesus raised his right arm and turning toward the four points of the compass, he slowly and solemnly gave his blessing to the whole world. Then the Savior spread out his hands and directed his gaze toward heaven. His whole body became increasingly luminous. The wounds of his hands glistened, and those of his feet shone brightly. A dazzling multicolored circle of light descended from the sky and completely enveloped him. Lowering his eyes, he looked a last time at his mother and his friends, who were all deeply moved in this solemn moment. It was a look that they would never forget. It was filled with the utmost kindness and tender love. Then he slowly began to ascend into the air, leaving on the stone a distinct impression of his sacred feet. As he rose higher and higher at a somewhat slanting angle, his wounds glowed brightly and his long white garment shimmered. While the stupefied disciples gazed after him with intense amazement and awe, his figure with its still gleaming wounds became so small and distant that it could scarcely be distinguished, until finally a cloud took him out of their sight. During his ascension, a mysterious shower of luminous dewdrops appeared to fall on the crowd. After a few moments, as the light became more normal, 
The dazed and shaken disciples were still staring at the sky in complete silence, when suddenly they heard a strong, clear voice. Looking down at the ground again, they perceived two white-clad angels resembling young men with long hair, standing on a nearby rocky ledge, each holding a staff in his hand like the prophets of old. Remaining absolutely motionless, the two angels said with one voice to the crowd, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up to heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you to heaven, will come in the same way as you have seen him going up to heaven. The angels then vanished as rapidly as they had come, while all who were present bowed their heads and remained thus for some moments. For now, with a profound shock, they fully realized what had just happened to them. Their beloved Savior had returned to His Father in heaven, leaving them to themselves on earth. Some of them were so grieved and heartbroken that they fell to the ground and wept disconsolately, like children. Others began to talk excitedly to one another. Often they looked up into the sky again, as if hoping to catch another glimpse of Jesus. Some were wrapped in silent thought and meditation, while others became skeptical and acted as if they did not believe what they had seen. Only Mary, Peter, and John were calm and serene, though deeply moved. Mary spoke to John and pointed to the stone and they saw the footprints of the Savior in it. Many others came up and knelt there, bowing their faces down to this spot. Then gradually their first sorrow over the sudden separation changed into profound happiness as they understood that their Redeemer was watching over them from the throne of His Father in heaven, and as they also recalled His promise to be with them always. Therefore, with great joy, they quietly dispersed and returned to the city in small groups. Later that day, the disciples assembled in the cenacle for prayer. But they could not help feeling troubled again, because they missed Jesus so keenly. They looked at one another helplessly, like lost children, until they saw how perfectly calm and confident Mary was. And they turned to her for encouragement and inspiration remembering that Jesus had told them always to go to her when they were troubled, for she would ever be, for all of them, a mother and a protectress. Chapter 34 Pentecost and the Early Church During the ascension of Christ, the Blessed Virgin underwent a marvelous mystical experience. By the will and power of Almighty God, her soul was raised with her Divine Son, and she was told to choose between remaining henceforth in the glory of heaven or returning to the world to guide and assist the new church. But when she looked down and saw the pitiful condition of the bewildered followers of Christ just after his ascension, she was stirred by compassion for them and for all mankind, and prostrating herself before the Holy Trinity, she said, Eternal God, I accept this task, and for the time being I renounce the peace and the joy of thy presence. I sacrifice it to further the love which thou hast for men. Accept this sacrifice, my Lord, and let faith in thee be spread, and let thy holy church be enlarged. Thus, by her own free choice and with the blessing of God, Mary returned to help in founding the church militant on earth. During the next nine days before Pentecost, she made an intensive retreat in the cenacle with the apostles, during which she prepared them for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Every day at the request of either St. Peter or St. John, she spoke to the twelve informally for one hour, explaining to them the great mysteries of the Christian religion as her Divine Son had taught them to her. She also prayed regularly with the apostles and disciples and gave them helpful instruction on mental prayer. Gradually they all realized that their departed Master had left them an ideal guide in His modest and holy Mother. And more and more they came to look upon Mary as their mediatrix with him 
and as the consoler and mother of his spiritual family, the church. Now they knelt before her whenever she gave them her blessing as they left or entered the cenacle. Every day during this novena to the Holy Spirit, the apostles were all united in heart and soul and mind. And while they prayed together, their fervor and charity increased. Early on Pentecost morning in the Seneca, Mary urged the apostles, disciples, and holy women, who numbered about 120, to pray and to renew their ardor as the hour was at hand when they were to be visited by the Spirit of God. They had often wondered anxiously just how this would occur. But now, as they took their places, they had complete peace of mind. St. Peter stood near one end of the hall in which the Last Supper had been celebrated, while Mary and the rest of the apostles stood around him. Thus they remained for some time, quietly engaged in fervent prayer, with their arms crossed on their chests and their eyes closed or looking down at the ground. The disciples and holy women were praying in various other rooms in the building, which soon became filled with perfect silence. Toward dawn, yet before sunrise, a luminous silvery cloud descended from heaven and covered the entire city of Jerusalem particularly Mount Zion and the Cenacle, over which an enormous mass of light seemed to condense and become transparent, like a sun throwing out its flames in all directions. Suddenly the sound of a violent wind arose, as though a cyclone were approaching from above, and the air resounded with a tremendous roaring that filled the whole house. Then this disturbance gave way to a display of light, a soft murmur, and a warm healing breeze. From out of the cloud appeared rays which intercrossed seven times in a fiery rainbow and fell like burning drops onto the cynical. At this moment the building and everything in it was flooded with a dazzling light. The apostles, and especially the Blessed Virgin, seemed to be blazing with a mystical transparent luminosity. In the rapture of their ecstasy, they simultaneously raised their heads and opened their mouths as though thirsting for heavenly grace. Then into each mouth there fell a jet of fire, a small parted tongue of live flame of varying degrees of intensity and color, in which the Holy Spirit came to them filling each person with divine inspiration and grace and wisdom. In the Holy Mother of God, these effects were altogether supernatural. She was utterly transformed and exalted in God. The apostles were also filled with a marvelous increase of grace, which they were never to lose. Into all of them, according to each individual's condition, were infused the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost wisdom, understanding, knowledge, piety, counsel, fortitude, and fear. By this wonderful blessing the twelve were transformed into truly apostolic founders and missionaries of the Church of Christ. Similar graces were communicated proportionally to the rest of the disciples and the faithful in general. All those who had felt some compassion for the Savior in his sufferings and death were interiorly enlightened and purified so that they were later disposed to become Christians. When all had received this mystical infusion from above, a holy inspiration filled the group in the Seneca. They were stirred to the depths of their souls, and they seemed almost intoxicated with happiness and confidence. As they gathered around the Blessed Virgin, who as ever remained perfectly calm and recollected, the apostles embraced one another, and throughout the little flock there flowed a new life and a new spirit of holy joy, faith, and courage. Then, while St. Peter and the other apostles went out into the city and openly preached the message of Christ with extraordinary fervor and inspiration, 
Mary remained in the Senegal, prostrate on the floor, praying for the conversion of all who heard the word of God. Quote, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. End quote. When the apostles returned to the Senegal, she welcomed them with great joy, and Peter introduced a group of the new converts to her, saying, My brethren, this is the mother of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, whose faith you have received. She bore him, remaining a virgin before, during, and after his birth. Receive her as your mother and intercessor, for through her you and we shall receive light, guidance, and release from our sins and miseries. And at Peter's request, the Mother of God gave them all her blessing and urged them to persevere strongly in the faith. During the days after Pentecost, Mary talked with many of the new converts in private interviews, and as all the secrets of their hearts were revealed to her, she gave each individual precisely the kind of practical advice which he or she most needed. And besides instructing groups of new Christians, she prayed fervently for them during many hours each day and night. Some wealthy converts offered her rich presents, but she always refused such gifts or inspired the givers to present them to the apostles for distribution among the poor. The Blessed Virgin gave the women an unforgettable example by nursing the sick personally with touching kindness. Often she prepared the apostles' meals and served them with impressive reverence. On the seventh day after Pentecost, when about 5,000 converts had been instructed, Mary prayed to her divine Son that they may receive the purifying sacrament of baptism and that the apostles might soon celebrate their first holy sacrifice of the Mass in order that the bread of life might then be distributed to the new children of the church. And the Lord said to her, My beloved dove, let what thou wishest be done. Then the Holy Spirit inspired St. Peter and St. John to consult the Mother of God while planning these two ceremonies. And at a meeting of the seventy-two apostles and disciples who were priests, Mary explained the significance of the Holy Eucharist and the Mass. At this meeting also, when the subject of money was being discussed, Peter and John asked the Blessed Virgin to describe to them the attitude that would be most pleasing to her son. And she said, My masters and brethren, many times during his life, our true teacher, my divine son, told me that one of the important purposes of his coming into the world was to uplift poverty and to teach it to mortals who have a horror of it. In his conversations, his teachings, and his holy life, he made me understand that the holiness and perfection which he had come to teach were to be based on the most perfect voluntary poverty and contempt of money. I am therefore of the opinion that we should all detach our hearts from the love of money and of wealth. In preparation for the solemn baptism and mass, the Mother of God helped the holy women in getting ready the linens, white cloaks, and other objects which the apostles would need. She provided the basins and bread and wine and she also cleaned and scrubbed the great hall of the Seneca. While the apostles were baptizing the converts, Mary was present, but she modestly stood at one side of the hall, praying for each of the reborn Christians. As a clear light, which was visible to everyone, descended on each person who was being baptized, everybody present was deeply moved. Afterward, St. Peter recited with the assembled apostles and disciples the same prayers and psalms that the Savior had used at the Last Supper. Taking the unleavened bread in his hands, he pronounced over it the words of the consecration, 
and he did likewise with the chalice. After he had received the blessed sacrament, the Mother of God humbly approached the altar, making three profound prostrations and touching the ground with her face. And then, from St. Peter's hands, she received the body of her Divine Son. When she returned to her place, for a long time she remained in an ecstatic trance, wholly absorbed and somewhat elevated from the floor, although her angels prevented this fact from being observed. Thereafter she very strictly limited the use of her five senses, and she ate still more seldom and more sparingly than ever. Some time later, when St. Peter and St. John were arrested by the Pharisees, they prayed to Mary for help, and in answer to her prayers for them, their Divine Master allowed her to send one of her angels to effect the acquittal of the two apostles. Similarly, she often sent some of her angels to help, guide, and encourage the other apostles when they were traveling and preaching the message of Christ throughout the Holy Land. The Blessed Virgin was especially kind to the saintly young disciple named Stephen, and she forewarned him that he was destined to be the first martyr of the church. Several times she was able to save him from being murdered by his enemies, and when he was finally arrested and brought to trial, the Lord permitted Mary's angels to carry her into the courtroom, where she appeared only to Stephen and inspired him to make the splendid discourse, which is recorded in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. It was due to this first apparition of the Mother of God that St. Stephen's face seemed to all who saw him, quote, as though it were the face of an angel, end quote. At the end of his talk, through Mary's intercession, he was given a vision of Christ at the right hand of God. And as the brave disciple was being condemned to death by stoning, the Blessed Virgin lovingly gave him her blessing and encouraged him. During his martyrdom she prayed fervently for him, and then she witnessed and rejoiced over his reception by his Lord into the glory of heaven. Knowing that the apostles were soon going to leave Jerusalem in order to preach the message of Christ throughout the world, the Mother of God realized that they needed one short formula or creed in which the whole Christian religion would be summed up. She therefore prayed and fasted for this intention during thirty days, until the Lord inspired St. Peter and the other apostles to consult her on this matter. After another ten days of prayer together, St. Peter met with the apostles and the Blessed Virgin, celebrated Mass, and distributed Holy Communion to them. And while they were all praying to the Holy Spirit, they heard the rumbling of thunder and saw the cenacle become filled with a supernatural light. Then Mary asked each of the apostles to define one of the mysteries of the religion of Christ as the Spirit of God would inspire them. And so, beginning with St. Peter, each of them, in turn, uttered one phrase after another of the Apostles' Creed, exactly as we have it today. Very appropriately, St. John contributed the words, Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. While St. Thomas continued, Descended into hell, arose from the dead on the third day. Then the Blessed Virgin, with her own hands, wrote out many copies of this creed for the various disciples preaching in different parts of Palestine, and her angels delivered the precious documents to some of the more distant followers of Christ. Before the twelve apostles left Jerusalem, Mary wove for each of them a brownish-gray robe similar to that of their master and she gave to each a large wooden cross and a small metal case containing some sacred relics of her divine son. Some of the thorns and pieces of the swaddling clothes and linens used at his circumcision and passion. 
the mother of God knew that Saul, the most fanatical persecutor of the new church, would eventually be converted. And for a long time she prayed very fervently for him, offering to suffer and to die, if necessary, for his conversion. And as a direct result of her prayers and sacrifices, as well as those of St. Stephen the Martyr, Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus and transformed him into a sincerely penitent Christian, revealing to him, among other things, how much he owed to Mary's intercession. On the day after his baptism, she sent one of her angels to give him her blessing and an assurance of her forgiveness and future assistance in his apostolate. Soon after the conversion of St. Paul, the Blessed Virgin, while praying for the Church, was shown in a vision the coming sufferings of its early saints and martyrs. The Lord then explained to her that despite her intense desire to take upon herself all that the first Christians would suffer, in the plan of divine providence, it was necessary that those holy martyrs should have such opportunities to earn their eternal reward and to advance the cause of the Church by their example. Later she described to Peter and John the conversion of Saul, their greatest enemy, and at the same time she warned them that all the followers of Jesus Christ would soon have to suffer cruel persecution at the hands of the enemies of his Church. Speaking of Pentecost, the Blessed Virgin said to Venerable Mother Mary of Agreta, My daughter, the children of the Church hold this blessing of Almighty God in small esteem and thankfulness. The Divine Spirit, in coming for the first time upon the Apostles, intended it as a pledge and proof that He would confer the same favor on the rest of the children of the Church and that he was ready to communicate his gifts to all who would dispose themselves to receive them. In our times, too, he comes to many just souls, although not so openly. Blessed is the soul who longs for this grace, which enkindles, enlightens, and consumes all that is earthly and carnal, and raises it up to a new union with God himself. As your true and loving mother, I want you to have this happiness, and therefore I again urge you to prepare your heart by trying to maintain an unshatterable inner peace and calm, no matter what happens to you. Chapter 35 Mary's Last Years The Blessed Virgin lived about fifteen years after our Lord's ascension, Yet there were never any wrinkles or signs of age in her lovely features, which always remained just as they were when she was in her thirty-third year. As time passed, Mary became more and more serious and recollected. No one ever saw her laugh, but she did occasionally smile with a very touching expression. She became quite thin and pale, for she slept very little often only a half hour, and she ate only very light meals consisting usually of nothing but plain bread and sometimes a little fish. When she appeared among the apostles on important occasions, she wore a large white mantle and veil and a long sky-blue scarf ornamented with embroidery. Usually she wore a simple white robe but she put on a black veil whenever she went along the sorrowful way of the cross in Jerusalem, for she regularly made devout pilgrimages to all the places which her divine Son had made holy by his sufferings during his passion. The mother of God loved St. James, the brother of St. John, with special tenderness because of his extraordinary generosity and fervor which made him the first of the twelve apostles to set out on an extended missionary journey and the first to suffer martyrdom. Consequently, after James left to preach the gospel in Spain, 
the Blessed Virgin often sent him help and consolations through her angels. Once in Granada she appeared to him and saved his life just as he was about to be executed. And later in another apparition in Saragossa, she informed him that God wanted him to found a shrine there in her honor and then return to Jerusalem and die a martyr's death. At this time, St. John, when Mary told him that Herod was about to persecute the Christians in the Holy City, urged her to seek a temporary refuge in Asia Minor. Although both of them would gladly have died as martyrs for Christ at any time, the Lord revealed to his mother that she should now accompany John to the city of Ephesus. Therefore, after again visiting all the holy places and after bidding a sad farewell to their friends, Mary and her adopted son John traveled to a port and embarked on a ship which sailed northward across the Mediterranean Sea. During her first trip on the water, the Mother of God prayed that the Lord might protect all ocean travelers who would ask for her intercession, and she gave her blessing to the fishes in the sea. In Ephesus, John and Mary settled in an isolated home of some poor women, where the Mother of God spent many hours praying fervently for the Christians who were suffering the cruel persecution of Herod in the Holy Land. On his way back from Spain, St. James visited the Blessed Virgin. She encouraged him to face bravely his approaching death in Jerusalem and asked him to intercede for the church as soon as he reached heaven. After requesting her always to give Spain her special protection and to be with him at the end, James sorrowfully said a last farewell in this world to the mother of his Lord and to his brother John. Then he left for Jerusalem, where he preached fearlessly until he was arrested and condemned to be beheaded. As he was being led to the place of execution, he prayed fervently for Mary's help, and just before he died, he was consoled by seeing a vision of the glorious Mother of God surrounded by her angels. And he silently said to her, Mother of my Lord, I beg you to offer the sacrifice of my life to your Son. Then Mary welcomed the soul of the first martyred apostle of Christ and accompanied him to his triumphant reception in the glory of heaven, where Almighty God said to her, My daughter, for the exaltation of my holy name, for thy glory, and for the benefit of mortals, I now give thee my royal word, that if men at the hour of their death call upon thee with affection like my servant James, I will look upon them with fatherly mercy. Meanwhile, St. Peter had also been arrested by order of Herod, as the Blessed Virgin in her retreat in Ephesus saw in visions all that was happening to the Christians in Jerusalem. She prayed more fervently than ever that this severe persecution might soon come to an end. Thereupon the Lord instructed her to send back into hell the demons who were stimulating the hatred of the church's enemies and to order one of her angels to free St. Peter from prison and to consent to the decree of God's justice that Herod, since his hard heart was beyond redemption, be stricken dead although Mary wept over the loss of that cruel ruler's soul. During their brief stay in Ephesus, the Blessed Virgin converted a number of persons to faith in Christ by the example of her charity among the poor and the sick, whom she regularly assisted with her own hands, particularly when they were dying. She prayed especially for the deluded young pagan priestesses of the famous Temple of Diana, and succeeded in bringing nine of them to belief in the true God. One day the Blessed Virgin received a letter from St. Peter, which out of humility she asked St. John to open and read to her. Peter requested them to meet him and the other apostles in Jerusalem in order to decide whether the practices of the Law of Moses should be retained among the Gentile converts. 
Mary and John therefore took the next ship to Palestine. During the journey, the devils tried desperately to make the boat sink in a series of terrible storms which lasted for 14 days, until finally, due to Mary's unwavering faith and prayers, her divine son appeared to her above the sea and calmed it. As soon as she arrived in Jerusalem, although she wished, first of all, to visit the way of the cross, the Blessed Virgin went right to the cenacle to greet St. Peter. Then, accompanied by her angels, she visited the holy places, and when she came to Mount Olivet, Jesus showed himself again to his mother as a reward for having obeyed St. Peter's summons before attending to her devotions. When St. Paul and St. Barnabas came to Jerusalem for the council, they went first of all to thank the mother of their Savior for their conversion. And as Mary knelt and kissed St. Peter's hands, he was favored with a mystical insight into the unique role of the Blessed Virgin in the Church of Christ. St. Peter insisted that Mary should attend the first meeting of the assembled apostles and disciples, at which he announced that they would pray together to the Holy Spirit for ten days before deciding the difficult question that confronted them. On the first and last day he celebrated Mass and distributed Holy Communion. The Blessed Virgin personally cleaned and decorated the Hall of the Cenacle for the first of these ceremonies. But during the ten days she retired to her room where she remained without eating or speaking to anyone. At this time she had a mystical experience in which she was shown Lucifer and all his companions being obliged to hear Almighty God announce to them that the Mother of the Savior would always defend his church from their attacks. Then the Lord told her to exercise her authority and drive the demons back into the abyss while the Holy Trinity assured her that the Church would ever be assisted by the omnipotence of the Father, the wisdom of the Son, and the love of the Holy Ghost. On the tenth day the Council met and wisely decided not to impose the ancient Jewish practices on the Gentile converts. Later, when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in turn began to write the Gospels, the Blessed Virgin not only prayed for them, but also appeared to each and requested him not to mention her except when absolutely necessary. Only St. Luke received her permission to write somewhat more freely about her, and he drew much of his information from her direct inspiration. Even when St. John wrote his Gospel some years after Mary's death, she appeared to him and told him, that it was still not opportune for him to reveal the mysteries which he knew concerning her part in the plan of the redemption. In order that many of the new Christians who had been idolaters should not make a goddess of the Holy Mother of their God. When the apostles and disciples left Jerusalem after the historic council, the Blessed Virgin gave to St. Paul and Barnabas some relics of Christ's clothes and objects used in the Passion. She continued to take a close personal interest in the travels and labors of all the principal missionaries of the new church, and therefore she commanded her angels to watch over them and report to her everything that happened to them. Very often, at her command, her angels appeared visibly to the apostles and encouraged them with messages from the mother of their master. At other times, the angels invisibly accompanied and protected them, or warned them of dangers and indicated what they should do in special circumstances. Besides frequently writing letters to the apostles, Mary was allowed to appear to them on several occasions when they prayed for her help in some emergency. Thus she appeared to St. Peter when he was in Antioch and again in Rome. With her own hands, she prepared all that was needed by the apostles for the service of the altar. Frequently, and especially on great religious feast days, she visited the poor and the sick in Jerusalem, consoling and assisting them by washing the women and children, 
and by giving them nourishing food, which she had cooked for them, or some clothing which she had accepted for distribution among the needy. The Holy Mother of God had now attained a degree of radiant sanctity in which the mere sight of her was, at times, sufficient to convert even bitter opponents of the Church. A prominent and cultured Jew for whom she had been praying was one day inspired by his guardian angel with the desire of seeing, merely out of idle curiosity, the mother of the now famous crucified Jesus of Nazareth. Yet as soon as Mary quietly and prudently spoke to this distinguished man, he fell to the ground at her feet, confessing Christ as the Savior of the world and begging for baptism. When Satan perceived all the good that the Blessed Virgin was accomplishing for the young church, he resolved to destroy her in one concerted attack by all his demons, which they launched against her one day while she was praying alone in her room. During this intense spiritual conflict, Mary prayed for all souls who are afflicted by the devil and the Lord granted her the power of protecting all who turn to her when they are tempted. Then the Savior appeared to her as her loving son, accompanied by Saint Joachim and Saint Anne and many patriarchs, prophets and angels. And Almighty God gave Lucifer a vision of the Blessed Mother as, quote, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon was under her feet, and upon her head was a crown of twelve stars." End quote. And the demons realized with anguish that they were defeated and bound by the God-given power of this Holy Virgin whom they had planned to destroy. Then the Lord said to his mother, My beloved, thou hast given me human form, thou hast followed and imitated me above all my creatures. Be thou, therefore, the protectress of my church. Command the infernal dragon that as long as thou shalt live in the church, he shall not sow the seed of error and heresy. For during the days of thy life, I desire that the church derive this advantage from thy presence. And as soon as Mary uttered the command, quote, that great dragon was cast down to the earth, and with him his angels." End quote. More and more as the years passed, the Blessed Virgin felt torn between her ever-increasing longing for union with God in heaven and her compassionate love for the Church and for mankind. She therefore had to strive to achieve the right adjustment between the active and the contemplative life. However, as she prayed for divine guidance in this difficult problem, God raised her to a unique mystical state of continuous abstractive vision which became more intense every day and which filled her soul with infused wisdom. Thus, by a special privilege, she enjoyed without interruption, whether working or resting, a profound and intimate spiritual union of heart, mind and soul with her beloved Son and God. Consequently, while remaining actively attentive to the needs and welfare of all the children of the Church, she was also able to be continually absorbed in prayerful contemplation. Every day of her life after the death of her Divine Son, and especially every Friday, the Blessed Virgin relived and commemorated the Passion of Jesus in all its harrowing details. In order to make reparation for the insults and tortures which she had suffered, she recited appropriate prayers and performed various acts of mortification for each of the hate-filled words and blows that sinful men had heaped on their God on Good Friday. Many times during these devotions, she wept tears of blood which covered her face, and she was bathed in a bloody sweat, so intense was her identification with her son's sufferings. She obtained St. John's permission to remain alone in her room each week from 5 o'clock on Thursday afternoon until Sunday morning. Then, beginning with the washing of the feet, she beheld in vision and compassionately re-experienced in her soul and body 
all that Jesus had endured for men during those hours in Holy Week. Nearly every day she heard Mass, usually celebrated by St. John, and received Holy Communion, after which she would withdraw and remain alone in her room for three hours. So fervent were her preparation before and thanksgiving after Communion that often her Divine Son responded by a personal visit to his mother. During these hours of ecstatic contemplation, St. John sometimes saw rays of bright light darting forth from Mary as she prayed. Toward the end of her life, through the intensity of her burning charity, the Blessed Virgin's soul had approached so closely to union with God that only the Lord's reluctance to deprive His Church of such an invaluable guide restrained Him from welcoming her forever into the glory of heaven. She then began to suffer a ceaseless spiritual martyrdom, for she could no longer hold back the overflowing force of her yearning for heaven and the beatific vision of God. Yet she was too humble ever to ask for the privilege of liberation from mortal life. At this time, therefore, Almighty God rewarded her with the special grace of celebrating the joys of the resurrection in a mystical way every Sunday and of enjoying a still more intimate union with him in daily communion. And he said to her, My most loving mother, I shall be with thee in a wonderful new manner as long as thy mortal life lasts and soon thou shalt be free from the fetters of thy mortal body." Henceforth, at the command of the Lord through an angel, St. John gave the Blessed Virgin Holy Communion every day until the end of her life. And at the moment when she received the Holy Eucharist, the Savior manifested himself to her in his sacred humanity in the form which he had when he instituted the Blessed Sacrament but his appearance was more glorious and more resplendent than at the Transfiguration. The Mother of God also commemorated every year with profound joy and gratitude the anniversaries of the Annunciation and the Nativity and many of the feasts honoring the mysteries of the Incarnation and the Redemption which the Church has since instituted. Every year on the Feast of the Ascension the Lord asked his mother whether she would prefer to remain henceforth forever in the joy of heaven or whether she wished to return to the world to help the church. Each year she humbly answered that if it was the will of God she would gladly return to labor for mankind for whom he had suffered and died. The Blessed Virgin said to St. Bridget of Sweden, After the ascension of my son, I still lived a long time in the world. Such was the will of God, in order that by seeing my patience and my conduct, many more souls might be converted to him, and in order that the apostles and other elect souls of God might be strengthened. Also the natural constitution of my being required that I should live longer, and that thereby my crown might be increased. During all the time that I lived after my son's ascension, I visited the places where he had suffered and where he had performed his miracles. Thus the memory of his passion became so imprinted on my heart that it ever remained quite fresh in my mind, whether I happened to be eating or working. My senses were so completely withdrawn from worldly things that I constantly alternated between new supernatural yearnings and sorrows. Yet I controlled my grief and my joy in such a way that I did not neglect any of my duties toward God. My way of life among people was such that apart from my scanty meals, I paid no attention to what human beings thought of me or expected me to do.